Naranjana, Jishora Nandana, Bajajana Ranjana, Jamana Tira Banachari, Jamana Tira Banachari, Jeradha Madhava Kunjabi Hari, Gopi Janavalava, Giribara Dari. Gopi jana bala ba, kiri vada dhari. Cheshwara nandana bhaja jana ranjana. Cheshwara nandana bhaja jana ranjana. Chamana tira panachari. Chamana tira Banachari Jiradha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Sisi Radha Madhava Kije Kandaraj Simad Bhagavatam Kije Nitai Go Pramanandi Hari Hari Bo. We are continuing, re continuing reading. From and Tanya is going to tell us where. Do you know? We finished we uh, with we finished the ninth chapter, but uh, on Monday you did a recap of uh, verse fifty-three. Yeah. So I'm going to look at fifty-four now, because I think that a recap and I added some things to it. Right. So we're going. I want to read verse fifty-four. 55, these are the last two verses. So this is Lord Nishingadev uh, talking to Pallad Maharaj. My dear Pallad, you are very fortunate. Please know for me that those who are very wise and highly elevated try to please me in all different modes of mellows, for I am the only person who can fulfill all the desires of everyone. So we had talked about that on Monday, thinking that I can fulfill my own desires is ignorance. Only Krishna can fulfill our desires. Although that's counterintuitive because we came to the, to the material world to fulfill our desires and we're still trying. And Krishna is saying, no, you can't. I'm the only one who can. So if you try to if you stop trying to fulfill your desires and try to fulfill my desires, then I will fulfill your desires. But if you try to fulfill your desires, then you're limited to your own power. And of course, limited to trying to fulfill them by exploiting matter and basically by entering into the mode of passion or ignorance. And that certainly doesn't work. You, you go to the Gita, basic instructions in the Gita, lust burns like fire, Kama Isha, Krota Isha, Rajagun, Samud Baba. You know, lust becomes anger when it's frustrated. So Krishna is telling us these things, and we read them as young devotees, and we related to them. Yes, this is the truth. Then Krishna is saying, Raso Varjam, Raso Piyasya. When you get a higher taste, you can give up the lower taste. We have that experience. At the same time, even though we have both of these experiences, we have to remind ourselves because the nature of Maya is that uh, as Maya makes us forget, as we know, we all have experience. We remember something and then we forget and then we engage in thinking of something or doing something which we had previously realized was futile. We forgot. And one may think, how could you forget something so significant as that? But that's Maya's job to make us forget. And Prabhupada's job is to make us remember. And how does he make us remember? By giving us his books. So by reading Prabhupada's books, by going to classes, we remember. And the whole, the whole point is Nityam Bhagavata Seva. In the Bhagavatam it says Nitya. Nitya means eternal or regularly. Bhagavata Seva. Seva means service. We should serve the Bhagavat. Serving the Bhagavat means you should hear it. That's how you serve it. Hear the Bhagavatam by serving it. Regularly, Nitya, 
So it's kind of like taking your medicine. You you need some vitamin. So take it every day because if you miss a day, you'll become low in that vitamin. So take your your Bhagavad vitamin every day because if you don't, you'll forget. That's that's the condition now. Not that in the future that will be there, but now that's the condition. What we know, we forget. We need to be reminded. That's just the way it is. And then, therefore, Prabhupada established Nitya Bhagavata Sevaya by establishing Srimad Bhagavatam class and by telling us, whenever you get time, read my books. You need these books, otherwise you will forget. Even though you think you won't forget, even though you had profound realizations, if we fall into the modes uh, under the influence of the modes of nature, that's what they do. They cause us to forget. We know that. We have experience of that. So let us remember Lord Nishingadev's words, I am the only one who can fulfill all your desires. And I like to, I like to think of it as trying to make money on your own. Some people are not very good at making money. And although they try, they never get rich. And some people are very good at making money. And although they don't try that hard, they get rich. It's just like some people do well in school. They don't try that much. They just do well, right? You know, someone like that, everybody hates those people, right? They have all the answers. You read all the books, you can't remember the answer. They skimmed over, they have all the answers. So. Trying to make money when you're not good at it is like trying to be happy when you're not good at it, and none of us are really good at it. And Krishna fulfilling all the desires is like the wealthy friend who you go to and say, can you help me make money? Because I don't know how to do this. And so he helps you, he tells you what to do. So Krishna is the one who can help us be happy. Otherwise, if you're gonna to try to be happy on your own, all I can say to you is good luck and uh, call me up when you hit the wall and are crying and we'll try to help you back, get back into it. And sometimes that's what Krishna does. Um, there are different verses in the Shastra and different explanations by Prabhupada how Krishna does this thing which we don't like, but Krishna knows exactly what we need to get us back on track when we go off track. So he does something to get us back on track. And a lot of times that's something that he does is not very pleasant for us, but he does it because he loves us. This is gonna hurt me more than it hurts you, whack. Yeah, so that's Krishna's mantra. This is gonna hurt me more than it hurts you and whack. Maya gives you a whack and then you, Oh, Krishna, please, please, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah, Krishna, Krishna knew you would do that. So sometimes that happens for your happiness. Okay, let's read the next verse. This is verse 55. We read last week also. Narada Muni said, Prahlad Maharaj was the best person in the family of Asuras who always aspire for material happiness. Nonetheless, although allured by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who offered him all benedictions for material happiness, because of his unalloyed Krishna consciousness, he did not want to take any material benefit for sense gratification. So I believe we read into the next chapter, the um, last, last Wednesday, no, or last Monday, or when was it? When I was with Bada Hari. Oh, that was Friday. Mm. Anyway, let's read these. I thought we read some of these. Is that true, Tanya? Do you remember? So we stopped at the end of the ninth chapter. Okay, all right. As far as I... Anyway, we'll read, and sometimes we remember that we read it after we read it. So this is text one of chapter 10. And this chapter is entitled, Prahlad, the best among exalted devotees. The Saint Narada Muni continued, although Prahlad Maharaj was only a boy, 
when he heard the benedictions offered by Lord Nishingadev, he considered them impediments on the path of devotional service. Thus he smiled very mildly and spoke as follows. He didn't want benediction. <clears throat> if Krishna ever offers you a benediction, you know what to say? You say, I want the benediction that I will never ask you for a benediction. And you go, oh, I outsmarted you, Krishna. Yeah. Anyway, so Prahlad is he's a little bit like that. I want the benediction that I won't ask you for a benediction. I want the benediction you'll never ask me to ask you for a benediction. Something like that. So text two. Prahlad Mara said, my dear Lord, O Supreme Personality of Godhead, because I was born in an atheistic family, I am naturally attached to material enjoyment. Therefore, Kindly do not tempt me with these illusions. I am very much afraid of material conditions, and I desire to be liberated from materialistic life. It is for this reason that I have taken shelter of your lotus feet. So the, the mood of a devotee you know, some, is, is not that whatever my desire is for material enjoyment, I wish Krishna would fulfill it. Rather, Krishna, whatever desire I have for material enjoyment, please don't give it to me. That's more the mood of a devotee. Don't tempt me with it. You know what I want, but I also know deep in my heart that I don't want it. So please don't tempt me. And Krishna says, yeah, I'll tempt you because you have to pass the test. So be careful, ladies and gentlemen. Krishna may tempt you with your desire, even though you, you don't at heart want it, but there may be some lingering of past samskaras that you like certain things. Um, it's not wrong to like things. It's wrong to like things that will destroy you spiritually. So we pray to Krishna, please don't tempt me. Tempt me. Please don't put these things in front of me because I'm weak. And so that prayer is good. But Krishna may say, no, nah, I want to test you. I want to see what you're made out of. And if Krishna does tempt us, then we can think Krishna is doing this to see what we're made out of. And this is a great opportunity to show him what we're made out of. And in fact, in a lecture on the teachings of Queen Kunti, Srimad Bhagavatam class, Prabhupada said, Krishna will test you to see what you're made out of. That's just, that's just, what it is. And you know, so many things in life are a test. Continually we're being tested, but Krishna may personally arrange a situation. Here, this is what you always wanted. What are you going to do now? Are you going to give into it? Or have you actually, will you turn your back on it? And if you turn your back on it, you get bonus points in bhakti. You get bhakti bonus points. And if you run towards it, then you get some momentary happiness and a lot of guilt and shame. So the cost benefit analysis is five minutes of sense gratification and five years of guilt and shame, basically, something like that. Or maybe the rest of your life of guilt and shame, or maybe five minutes, five days, five months, it depends. But you get the point. And that's always good to think when there's a temptation, if I give into this, what will I get? And what will I have to pay for it afterwards? And afterwards you have to pay for it with this. I'm so stupid, why did I do that? I feel so bad. That can be, that can be very helpful. Projection into the future, but looking at the consequences of our actions sobers us, that's a sign of intelligence. Discrimination, intelligence is discrimination. And if we act only on emotion, we lose discrimination. And then we want pleasure in the moment and we forget the consequences. Again, the forgetfulness, the Maya's trick again, as long as we can forget every shloka we ever memorized, every purport we ever read in that moment, then we'll give in. Yeah. So always remember, always think of the future. Always think of your future when you consider an action.
because in case, you know, in that moment, we, we don't worry about the future, but obviously the future will be coming with its reaction. And so we should think about it. And even though I may be attracted to do something, I don't do it because I know it will have a detrimental effect in the future. There may be many, many reasons not to do it. That's one of them. Okay, so let's read on. This is text number three. O oh, my worshipable, worshipable Lord, because the seed of lusty desires, which is the root cause of material existence, is within the core of everyone's heart. You have sent me to this material world to exhibit the symptoms of a pure devotee. That is interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm going to read from the purport what Prabhupada is saying here. In spite of coming to this material world, the Nitya Siddha devotee is never attracted by the allurements of material enjoyment. A perfect example is Prahlad Maharaj, who was a Nitya Siddha, Maha Bhagavata devotee. Although Prahlad was born in the family of Hiranyakashipu, an atheist, he was never attached to any kind of materialistic enjoyment. Desiring to exhibit the symptoms of a pure devotee, the Lord tried to induce Prahlad Maharaj to take material benedictions, but Prahlad Maharaj did not accept them. On the contrary, by his personal example, he showed the symptoms of a pure devotee. In other words, the Lord himself has no desire to send his pure devotees to the material world, nor does a devotee have any material purpose in coming. When the Lord himself appears as an incarnation within this material world, he is not allured by the material atmosphere, and he has nothing to do with material activity. Yet, by his example, he teaches the common man how to become a devotee. Similarly, a devotee who comes here in accordance with the order of the Supreme Lord shows by his personal behavior how to become a pure devotee. A pure devotee, therefore, is a practical example for all living entities, including Lord Brahma. So one of the points that's being made here is in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells us how to act like a pure devotee. But it's difficult if you don't have an example. And not only difficult if you don't have an example, sometimes if there's no example, then we think, well, nobody can do it. It's just an idea. It's just an idea. This is what a pure devotee is, but very few have become pure. So therefore, Bhagavatam takes off where the Gita leaves off by teaching through example through the lives of great devotees, of what Krishna is teaching in Bhagavad Gita, and then and also taking it further. So the benefit of hearing about Prahlad Maharaj is therefore obvious because we're hearing about the behavior of a pure devotee. And that's so important because we have choices to make. And if we can remember Prahlad Maharaj, when we undergo difficulty, then maybe we'll choose to act like Prahlad Maharaj. And maybe we'll become inspired to act like Prahlad Maharaj. Maybe we can think, yes, the situation I'm going through is difficult. And like Prahlad Maharaj, I need to learn to be tolerant, forbearing, peaceful, calm, I, I need to learn not to give up my sanity, my bhakti, just because I'm being harmed or criticized. So that's the idea. And so in order for Krishna to teach, even him, he himself thought the same thing. I taught Bhagavad Gita, nobody understood what bhakti, what, especially what prema is. I have to come and show it. They don't know what it is. 
<clears throat> I just heard a story this morning. The devotees were looking at a church and they were thinking of buying it. And there was a book in the church that said, what does God look like or something like that. And Prabhupada said, we should buy the book. And the, the person in the church gave them the book. And when they were in the car, Prabhupada said, read the book. And the book was going nowhere. And it wasn't explaining what God looks like. And Prabhupada said, I have no idea. So in a similar, similar way, you know, we talk about love, love of God. And, and we know when people talk about love of God in general, they're talking about what God is doing for them. I love God. Why do I love God? Because he gives me everything. Will you love him when he takes it away? Is that also love? For many people, that will not translate as love. So we need the Bhagavatam, and we need these examples of devotees, like Prahlad Maharaj, who when his father is trying to kill him. He's not saying, Krishna, why are you doing this to me? I'm just trying to preach for you. I'm just trying to serve you. Now, look what you're doing. I don't understand. I'm losing my faith. I feel like giving up. Did, did Prahlad say that? Of course not. Have you ever said that? Maybe. Or something in that direction? Maybe. At least the Krishna why? I was just trying to serve you. I went. I once went on a preaching program, and we were coming back, and we stopped somewhere. I don't know why. And I op I looked behind me, and there was nobody. And I opened the door, and a car slammed right into the door, completely destroyed the door. If I would have gotten out a second earlier, I would have been slammed into the door. So my first reaction was, Krishna, I was just trying to preach. You know, if I would have stayed at home, no slam door. And uh, like, why? You know, I don't know if you have this experience, but sometimes when you try to preach, things like this happen that don't happen when you just go about your ordinary business. That it makes you think, Krishna, why are you doing this? But Prahlad Maharaj didn't, of course, after when I became, came to my senses, I realized, well, Krishna saved me from getting out of the car a second or two earlier. So um, in any case, I think many of us, if not all of us, sometimes have these thoughts. I'm just trying to serve you. Why? You know, you bang your toe. Why, Krishna, why do you give me, why do you want me to suffer like this? I'm just, you know, just walking in to the house to cook an offering for you and I bang my toe. It may be because you're clumsy also, not like Krishna had nothing to do with it, but still we may think that way. So Prahlad Maharaj is a good example because we see he never complains. I heard something really, really, really interesting this morning. We all like to complain. Some like to complain more, some like to complain less. Some of us have stopped complaining. Some of us are just getting warmed up. And some of us are on the freeway. We're doing really well. Of course, complaining also in, it will include an aspect of complaining is criticizing. So it was being explained in this talk this morning that if you have a tendency to criticize, then go to the Judd Bharat story. So you can criticize him because that story is analyzing why he fell down. So if you, if you make the so-called criticism of Jad Bharat or Maharaj Bharat as a renunciate, when he fell down, you'll benefit from that because that story is trying to show what happens when you give up, when you deviate and you give up sadhana. So let's criticize Maharaj Bharat. Bharat. He gave up, because that's actually what we're doing in a sense, although not directly, but when we talk about the story, we're talking about his mistakes, and that's what criticism is when you talk about someone's mistakes. Oh, yesterday, Rasika ate 48 chapatis, like, you know, I can't believe it. And they're all made out of corn, that's even worse. You know? So he was making the point that if I do that, I don't benefit, but often when I do, when I make the criticism, then it comes back on me that the fault that I'm criticizing. 
by nature's law, infects me. So if we have a tendency to criticize, we read the story of Maharaj Bharat, and we're just criticizing. Look what he did. He gave up a sadhana. He was attached to a deer. He became a deer in his life, you know, in his next life. Be careful. Don't do that. This is bad. This is wrong. It's bona fide criticism because it purifies us. Isn't that interesting? So if anyone is ever criticizing, you say, Prabhu ji, mata ji. If you want to criticize, criticize Maharaj Bharat when he became attached to the deer because that will purify you. <laughs> I was when I heard that I was like, oh, oh, this is quite interesting. Yeah. So Prahlad, Prahlad Maharaj is our hero. He doesn't complain. Amazing. If anyone has any right to complain, definitely is him. <clears throat> if you know, <clears throat> if you think about all the things you complain about, I don't think it is close to what Prahlad Maharaj could have complained about. Right? Not even close. Not even in the same universe, right? Okay, let's go to the next verse. Text four. Otherwise, O my Lord, O supreme instructor of the entire world, you are so kind to your devotee that you could not induce him to do something unbeneficial for him. On the other hand, one who desires some material benefit in exchange for devotional service cannot be your pure devotee. Indeed, he is no better than a merchant who wants profit in exchange for service. This is a famous verse. Uh, Prabhupada quotes a lot. And, and, and in Prabhupada's translation of this, uh, sometimes he says, he paraphrases it by saying, when Lord Nishingadev offered Prahlad a benediction, Prahlad said, my dear Lord, I'm not a businessman where I'm making a deal with you, that I will chant 16 rounds, follow four principles and clean your temple every day, but you must give me this. He said, I, I don't want to do that. So this point is explained in many places. One place where Prabhupada said a devotee does not desire to go to Vaikuntha to have a body like Krishna or to have the opulences, opulences of Krishna and so forth. Because on that stage of love, that would be an impurity in the relationship. Like we have that story where Prabhupada asked Sham Sundar if he would, if he would ask George Harrison to give a donation. And up to that point, Sham Shundar did not ask George Harrison for any donations. George Harrison would offer. And sometimes we'd ask for help. We need help with this, but he would never ask specifically for money. And he didn't want to. And when he first asked, and George said his first response was, you're just like everybody else. You just, you just want money from me. So it ruined the relationship. Anyway, at that point, there was a big storm and thunder and lightning and all the lights went out. And George Harrison took it, oh, I guess Krishna wants me to say yes. That was quite a indication because right after he asked the question, it happened. Boom. But my point is that as soon as he asked the question, it disturbed the relationship. So in the same way, the pure devotee, because they have this relationship of pure love, it would disturb that relationship if they ask Krishna for something. So spontaneously, naturally, they won't even think of asking. It's, it's outside the realm of that relationship. For us, it's inside the realm of our relationship with Krishna. And we have to try to go outside that realm because it's not natural. Because... We need so many things, and we're not always happy, and we're not always peaceful, and we know if we're going to get anything from anybody, it's going to be from Krishna, because he's the only one who can give it, and we're devotees. That's where we should ask. But as you progress in devotional service, the reluctant to ask for anything other than what will help your bhakti decreases. Your faith that whatever happens is Krishna's arrangement, 
and also you understand I should be intelligent instead of at, instead of falling into the ditch and asking Krishna to get me out of the ditch. I should just be careful and not fall into it in the first place. So these are the kind of things that that go through a devotee's mind. But still, if we fall into the ditch accidentally or circumstantially, and there's no way to get out, we will pray to Krishna. But ultimately, we always have to to mold those prayers in a way that the ultimate goal of those prayers is to advance myself in Krishna consciousness. Because if it's not, we should not ask. Not in our stage of bhakti. Maybe when you're first coming, you can ask because it's better you approach Krishna. Akama, sarva kama, va, moksha kama, and dharadi. This verse in Bhagavatam is it's interesting, but it's not really meant for sadhakas. It's meant for people in general. Whether you sa kama, you have all desire. Sa, sarva kama. A kama, you have no desire. Moksha kama, you want liberation. Go to Krishna, do bhakti to get it. So sometimes in our books, there are instructions which are not actually meant for devotees, and devotees don't know that, and they get confused. Lots and lots of instructions. I don't want to say lots and lots, but there are. Um, there's an instruction about how, in Manusamita, it says, <clears throat> even though the husband is the number one rascal, debachi, etc., the wife should always serve him faithfully, humbly, respectfully, whatever he does, et cetera, et cetera. And it says in this way, she will go to the higher planets or in her next, in her next birth, she'll take birth as a man. Ladies, you know, so you t if I told you, if I told you, Kavita, you cannot go back to God in this life until you take birth as a man. What would you think? And I say, well, it's in the Mano Samhita. It's right there in our scripture. But that scripture is not meant for a devotee. That point is not meant for a devotee. You go directly to Krishna. Wherever your husband goes, up or down, if you're, if you're a devotee, you'll go to Krishna. So sometimes instructions in Shastra are meant for ordinary people. And then we think they're meant for devotees. And it's really confusing. And devotees are having big debates. No, but it says here, no, but that's not for us. So, akama sarva kama va moksha kama undaradi tivrena bhakti yogena yajeta parusham param purusha yajeta purusham param tivrena bhakti yogena with full force do bhakti. Okay, that's a good instruction, do bhakti. So it's kind of a trick. It's kind of a trick. Krishna's tricking. Oh, right, whatever you want, come to me. And how will you get it? Do bhakti. What kind of bhakti? Tivrena. Strong. Okay. I want a good husband. I want a good this. I want a good that. I want to get out of this country. I want to do this and that. And get a green card here and there. I'm going to go to Mangalartik every day. I'm going to chant my rounds really well. I'm going to do all these things. It's just a trick. Krishna's tricking you. One time, Prabhupada was walking with the devotees and Prabhupada said, is a devotee simple or is a devotee crooked? Simple meaning straightforward. And the devotee said, Prabhupada, devotees are simple. Prabhupada said, is he simple or is he straightforward? Meaning that's the wrong answer. And at least in that, in that where Prabhupada was going with this discussion, that was the wrong answer in that situation. Prabhupada said, I attracted you with prasadam. So just come, just take prasadam. And I fed you, fed you up to the neck. And I said, you don't have to shave your head, wear a dhoti, and just come. He said, I was very crooked. By me being crooked, I attracted you. So your devotee is crooked. So this verse, akama sarva kama va, second canto, whether you're full of desires, have no desires, a moksha kama, you want liberation. That's Krishna saying, Okay, you know, you don't have to be a pure devotee to do devotional service. Even if you want something, at least do devotional service. Like we have this, I don't know if I told you this. Nadia, listen to this. This is going to blow your mind. Because this is a story in Russia. 
or Ruski. This is a Russian story. There was a devotee who was initiated in Ruski in Russia. Did I tell you this story? And at that time, Prabhupada was, he didn't want to push the Russians. So he said, you don't have to follow the four. Don't, don't ask him to vow to follow the four principles. So here we have an initiation with, with no vow to follow principles because he just wanted him to chant 16 rounds. Okay, just chant 16 rounds. Don't worry about these other things. Prabhupada felt that at that time in Russia, it, it could be difficult uh, for the Russians. Maybe he was thinking they couldn't give up meat or, or alcohol. I don't know what he was thinking. He was just thinking that might be a turnoff for them because they might look at those principles and think, I don't know if we can do this. We're not used to this. So um, that's kind of like Krishna saying, you know, well, just don't worry about it. Just do devotional service. Do I have to give up this or that? Don't worry about it. Just do devotional service. Even to the point where he was willing to initiate him because he knew he was sincere, he would chant sincerely, and then everything would be good. Hare Krishna. So, but when you look at the philosophy of bhakti, then it becomes clear it's all about not asking Krishna for anything other than pure devotional service. That, that becomes clear. And so when you're trying to understand bhakti, you can't understand it through isolated statements like this, which specifically were meant to bring people to the path of bhakti. They weren't statements for people practicing it because it's saying, if you have these desires, you should do bhakti. You should do it means you're not doing it yet. So then you have to understand contextually why those statements are there. But if you wanna to come to a conclusion, you, you, you have to take in consideration of all the instructions, but also the essence that comes out of all those instructions that keeps coming up. I heard a story this morning, it's really interesting. There's a word called bhavarta. Bhavarta means, arta means goal, or yeah, in this sense it means goal, or say benefit, goal. Bhava means emotion. So Prabhupada was talking to a devotee who was translating from Bengali, Bengali to English. And he said, do not do a literal translation, do a translation of, in your own words according to what you feel is the essence of what it means. And Prabhupada said, Bhavarta. And he said, that is how I translate. So that's important because sometimes you may have noticed that you read the word meanings and you read the translation and you're like, you're going back and forth. It didn't say that in the word meanings or, or there's a word meaning and it's a whole sentence. And the sentence is something like, this is what this word means to spread the Krishna consciousness movement around the world. And you're thinking that word means to spread the Krishna consciousness movement around the world. Man, maybe the word is sarva like, or sablok means everywhere, all the world. To spread the Krishna consciousness movement around the world. That's what it means. But understanding what Mahaprabhu means, but understanding the mission of Mahaprabhu, the mission of Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Bhakti Siddhanta, like Prabhupada could say that because that's the Bhavarta, that is the essence. So when you're trying to understand the philosophy of Krishna consciousness and you isolate a point, and, you, and number one, don't understand the context, but you focus on that point and you don't understand all the other points, but more importantly, you don't understand the essence, the mood that pervades, predominantly pervades Prabhupada's instruction, then you can misunderstand. So what pervades Prabhupada's instruction? Pure bhakti, don't ask anything for Krishna. Now we understand why, because it ruins the love. If, if, I, if we have this amazing relationship and then I ask you for something, that's very selfish. It, it can ruin the relationship. Everything's going good. And then I say, Tanya, I heard you just got inheritance. Can you buy me a house? I, ah, is that why you were so nice to me? You ever feel like that? When someone asks you a question, you go, oh, I was always wondering, why were they so nice to me? 
Oh, now I understand why. I always tell devotees, if you ever make a big inheritance, you get a, like a raise, you know, you're getting six, fifth, six, fifth, six figures. Um, some, some people get six figures every month. Some people get more than six figures every month. Um, you may not want to tell anybody and you may just keep the same old car and the, live in the same apartment. Like don't let anybody know because once they know, you're going to gain a lot of false friends with a lot of requests, right? Of course, you'll become one of the most popular devotees in ISKCON. Every sannyasi in ISKCON and temple president GBC is going to be knocking on your door. Prabhu, can you come over for lunch? We'd love to have you. Like, who are you talking? Who are you talking to? <laughs> so anyway, if you want to be called over for lunch by all the big shots, yeah, tell them how much money you inherited. You'll get a lot, a lot of. You'll be able to do a lot of service. That's for sure. But anyway, we're kind of half joking here, but you know, I think this point is important and it's clear when. When often we talk about the pure devotee doesn't want to ask Krishna for anything, a lot of devotees are thinking, well, if I didn't ask Krishna for anything, I will go nuts. Like, how could I not ask him? He like, can give me anything. You can ask Krishna for anything if it helps your bhakti. No problem. And that's what pure devotees do. They pray for pure bhakti. They pray to remove obstacles. And even if it's something material, we have to be real, right? You have to be real, you can't be artificial. Being artificial doesn't work. So sometimes we pray to Krishna, Krishna, can you please send me this or that? It would, I just really need this for my sanity, my peace of mind. If I just had this, I would be, it would be good for my bhakti. I maybe could live without it, but it's very difficult. And I think I would be better off. So, you know, and sometimes, sometimes you're thinking about something. Have you ever been in this situation? You're thinking about something, which Prabhupada calls the, this dilemma. Should I eat the ladu or shouldn't I? Should I eat it or shouldn't I? This is like all day. Should I? So the, in, instead of going on with your service, the whole day you're thinking about the ladu. And so your friend might say, why don't, you, why don't you just eat the ladu so you stop thinking about it? Yeah, but I really shouldn't eat ladu because, you know, sense gratification, I don't really need it, sweets, etc. Yeah, that's true. You don't really need it. And probably because you don't need it, we can say it's sense gratification, even though it's prasadam, but you'll eat it just to enjoy it, not to honor it. <clears throat> and all that's true, but what's better? thinking about lotto all day or, or thinking about your service. Because once you eat the lotto, you can stop thinking about the lotto. So sometimes we may ask Krishna, please help me with this because we're thinking about it. It's driving us crazy. And we're, and we're thinking, I wish I wasn't thinking about this, but in the mood of being real, yeah, I am thinking about it. And I've been thinking about it every day for the last, who knows how long. And I'm trying to, detach from it, purify it, but I'm still thinking about it. Okay, so better eat the ladu. And then after you eat the ladu, Prabhupada said, then you can think, eh, actually I didn't eat the ladu. And then you can lament. So, but that, that's a shorter route because then you just think of the ladu for another second, eh, I didn't really need it. And then it's gone. So sometimes it's like that, that we wish we didn't need something. We wish we didn't have to try to get it. But in the long run, we understand that it will be better for my bhakti if I just have it, because then I can stop thinking about it. And eating is always like that, right? I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I have to eat, I have to eat. Why? Because if I don't eat, I mean, like, I don't know what I'll do. I'll chop down a tree, I'll strangle somebody, I just got to eat. Eat what? Anything, just get something in my stomach, you know? And then you gobble it down and like, <sighs> Okay, I can go back to work. It's like that sometimes, right? So, although you might eat, you might eat like, it might look like you're just 
totally out of control. You might just have a kind of body that when it gets hungry, the world stops. And if you don't eat, it, you're dangerous. Don't get near you. There are people like that. If they don't eat, they just get become angry. You know people like that? Don't get near them when they're hungry. They'll just like, get out of my way. Don't bother me. Don't talk to me. I'm hungry. Okay, so if that's you, that's just, that's how you are right now. Hopefully when you're more advanced, you'll have more control. But now that's what you're like. So when you're hungry, you better eat. Lest you be dangerous. Lest you commit some offense. Prabhu, I'm sorry I committed offense. I was just hungry. Uh -huh. You've told me I was a total idiot, rascal, baboon. Wish that I were dead because you were hungry. And I'm supposed to forgive you for that? Uh -huh. Yeah, Prabhu, when I get hungry, I just, like I get, like I could, it's like Lord Shiva enters my body. I don't know what it is. So some people are like that. So that that's how you are. That's how you are. But as you progress in bhakti, you will naturally see that you have faith in Krishna. Whatever happens, it just happens. You know, it's, it's like, it's okay. It's okay. Krishna, what you just did is not okay. I do not accept that. Take it back. You know, you don't think like that. That's how conditioned souls think. How could he do that? If he's God, I don't know. I'm going to leave this God. Find a better God or something. How do you, Krishna? Okay. Let's keep reading. We're going to go to text number five. A servant who desires material profits from his master is certainly not a qualified servant or a pure devotee. Similarly, a master who bestows benedictions upon his servant because of a desire to maintain a prestigious position as master is also not a pure master. So this sometimes comes up. We don't see this so much now, at least not in the West. But we have heard that those who are not pure, who take the position of guru, often seek out qualified disciples to increase their prestige. We heard this in relation to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. Generally, the guru does not approach someone to become their disciple. Hey, hey, can you become my disciple? I heard you have a lot of money. I heard you're a great scholar. If you become my disciple, be good for me. Yeah. So we've heard like that. Prestige for the guru. That's an offense. Dangerous. Uh, guru can fall down. One could also argue the guru has already fallen down if he thinks that way. So, so Prahlad Mars is saying both sides, the servant asking and then the master giving so he can control the servant. Servant giving to get from the master, the master giving to get from the disciple. This is not pure love. Correct? Text six. Oh my Lord. If you go to New York, you have to say Lord. Oh my Lord. Because if you say, oh my Lord, maybe they won't understand what you're saying. Oh my God, oh my Lord, Lord Krishna, the Supreme Personality of God here. Even I think it's funny, and I'm from America, when people talk, you know, sometimes they say, Lord Krishna. I go, we don't take Lord. What are they talking about? Anyway, having fun here. Oh my Lord, I am your unmotivated servant, and you are my eternal master. There is no need of our being anything other than master and servant. You are naturally my master, and I am naturally your servant. We have no other relationship. So just clarifying. Yeah, let's keep this pure. Text 7. Oh, my Lord, best of the givers of liberation, if you at all want to bestow a desirable benediction upon me, 
then I pray from your Lordship that within the core of my heart, there be no material desires. What a perfect prayer. You like that? So it's, it's kind of like I was saying before. Okay, I want, I want the benediction that I won't ask you for anything. It's kind of like, okay. You know, because, because there was this argument going on with Lord Nishringadeva was saying, please take a benediction. And Prahlad Maharaj is saying, no. And Nishringadeva is saying, yes. And Prahlad is saying, no. Yes. No. Please. No. No, I don't want to take it. No, please take it. I want to give you. No, no, I don't want to take it. And so Prahlad Maharaj is saying, okay, okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, okay, I'll ask something. Okay, if you want me to ask something, I'll ask something. I'm asking that I don't ask anything of you other than pure bhakti. Yeah, so that's that's what's going on. So, so now the reason this story is so good is because we're seeing in front of us what is pure bhakti. We're seeing it in real time, Krishna interacting with his devotees. Now, Prahlad Maharaj, he represents more for us of a devotee we can relate to now in our conditioned state because he's kind of coming from that asuric background conditioned soul. You know, if this conversation between takes place between the gopis and Krishna, we'll just say, well, of course, they're gopis. I mean, how could you be a gopi if you and they couldn't get that position if you didn't have that bhav? Or we would say, well, they're eternal associates of Krishna. They're manifestations of Radharani. The highest bhakti is contained within that realm. So we just kind of, you know, we, we could tend to ignore it a little bit. So this is, this is clear, more clear, I think. You know, this is, this is not exactly the kind of conversation Krishna would have with the gopis. Exactly. This is more like when someone is becoming pure from the conditioned state, this is more like, I want to offer you. I don't want to take it. But I want to give you. I don't want to take it. I just want to be pure. That's what I want. So we've always heard that the devotee doesn't ask anything. We always heard that Krishna wants to give everything. And here we see it in action. In real time, on the pages of Bhagavatam, Krishna is giving and the devotee is saying, no, I don't want, I just want. If you want to give me something, purify me of my material desires, give me pure bhakti. Now, one of the things you will notice if you look at all the prayers of devotees in the Bhagavatam, they always come to this conclusion, give me pure bhakti. Like pure bhakti is, is the most cherished thing for the devotee. That's what they all, that's what we're striving for every moment, isn't it? Through our sadhana and service, what is the goal? We want pure bhakti. So if Krishna says, what do you want? I'll give it to you. This is obviously what we want. This is what we're dedicated to get. And this is what we see as most valuable, more valuable than anything. And so Krishna, well, I'd like a new car and a new house. And, you know, could I trade my old wife in for a new one? And, you know, I was checking out this guitar in this guitar shop down there on Oxford Street. It's really good. Could I get that too? And No, it doesn't. The devotee will never think that way. He'll think pure bhakti. So in, in the sixth chapter of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna describes a yogi. And he says, once having obtained this, he thinks there is no greater gain. And so what is that? So the verse describes that he's realized the super soul within him. So he's made that connection. So whether you want to call it super, super soul realization, in this case, that's the context. It's a yogi. Or you've connected with Krishna in some other way. He thinks this is it. There's nothing else. Like So when you have that, it's natural you wouldn't ask. From our perspective, sometimes we think, how could you not ask? Krishna's right there. You could get anything. You know, say, Krishna, I want pure bhakti, but could I have a few side dishes? How about a side of, you know, okay, pure bhakti is like the veggie burger when I want a side of chips. We call them French fries. And a little salad. Could I get that? You know, I want pure bhakti, but can I get the, the nice house, the nice wife, nice husband, nice car, nice... Prabhupada's mood was that if you feel you need side dishes, you can ask Krishna, 
but there should be some reluctance. Krishna, I need these things. I wish I didn't, but I do. But if I if I just have them, it'll. They're there. These desires are my heart, but I want to. You know, I want to. I just need this to be peaceful. So, side dishes are there in in um, certain stages of bhakti, but the point is that as you advance. No side dishes, none of this, but it'll be natural. You won't force yourself. What do you want? Oh, I shouldn't pray for anything. Oh, okay. Uh, I just want pure devotional service. Huh. I get an A on my test for saying that. Huh. And you have a million other desires in your heart. You know, it's not like that. A lot of times we do things in Krishna consciousness because that's what you're supposed to do, but our heart is like completely against it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it brings you to that point where your heart should be in the right place. Sometimes it frustrates you and drives you crazy because you're stretched too far and you, you know, you stretch a ligament, you've gone too far. But I just don't want anybody to think that this idea of just asking Krishna for pure bhakti is like something difficult, unnatural, artificial it's just how the pure devotee feels if i have pure bhakti then like what else do i need like something is better than that no there's nothing better that's why dhruva maharaj samin kutar tolski bharanam nayache now that i have you it's like what do you want and, and dhruva maharaj is saying well i have you so like how could i want anything else like there's something else to want now that i have you it's like what kind of question you know, what do you want? What kind of question is that to ask? I have you. He's like, there's something better than you. Like, I don't want anything. And Vishnu is like, yeah, you do. You want a planet. Yeah, that was last week. But that was before I saw you. Yeah, but I know you want it. So we'll give it to you. And so Prophet also explains that, that Krishna likes to fulfill desires, especially the ones you don't want anymore. Because... If you still want them, they're probably not going to be good for you. So, so often you'll find in the life of a devotee, when the devotee only wants to satisfy Krishna, then Krishna has, you know, kept that devotee's list of all these desires that he prayed for a million times that he never, that Krishna never fulfilled. And Krishna says, oh, now I can fulfill those desires because you really don't want them anymore. So they're not going to be impediments, but I know it would be nice if you had them, you'd probably you know, make your life better. So, okay, I'll fulfill them. So it works like that. So how do you get Krishna to fulfill your desire? By not desiring it. Wow, profound, isn't it? How did it happen like that? I don't know. It just works that way. <laughs> I've had so many things come to me, and I'm like, Krishna, why do you give this to me? I don't even want it. Yeah, but you did. And I know the fragrance is there somewhere. I mean, you won't mind if I give it to you, will you? No, I won't mind. I always joke with devotees. I say, come back, come and visit, stay with us. And I go, beach house, house on the beach, I'm there. So it's kind of like a, a little joke in our family. You want me to come? The beach house, get the beach, rent the beach house, buy the beach house, build the beach house. I'm moving in. So that's just, you know, it's like, if I don't get a beach house, I'll be fine. Chanting Hare Krishna is better than a beach house, for sure. So, but like, you know, we all have these little things like, well, be, you know, some of you like to live in the mountains. Yeah, it would really be nice, nice to live in the mountains by a stream. You know, Krishna knows that. So it's possible someday it just happens, you know. Your Uncle Harry says, I'm dying tomorrow and I have a house in the mountains and I want to give it to you. I'm like, okay. And you forgot about it, that you even wanted it because you're just out there distributing books and you're in ecstasy. And then you're like, oh, Krishna, I even forgot I wanted that. And you remembered. So sometimes it's like that. So, Hare Krishna. Okay, it's time for questions. So we go to the chat and we see what's happening in the chat. You have all the verses in the chat. Nadi says, that's why I always pray to remember all these horrible things and miseries I had to undergo before I came to India. I'm afraid to forget it. Just take everything for granted, yeah. 
If you want to become a pure devotee, there's no better place than Siberia. That's, a, that's the purport of this. Because if you remember Siberia, you'll never want to take birth again in the material world. Thinking, oh no, I could take birth in Siberia. That would be worse than death. Okay. Is that correct, Nadia? Is that why Krishna had you take birth there? Just so you never come back again? And he also had you take birth there so you could appreciate Mayapur. Because, you know, you like live in America, you go to Mayapur, ah, oh, too many bugs, it's too hot, and these are too dirty, I'm going back. But, you know, the Russians don't think like that. Because there are a lot more Russians there than from, I think, you take the total of the rest of the world, there's more Russians there, right? And Ukrainians in Mayapur. My wife and I talk about it a lot. And we always say, yeah, it's much, you know, it seems for them, their life is much, much nicer in India. But if you come from a place where life is, you know, everything is like lots of money and everything's organized and clean and there's welfare and this and that, then you're like, yeah, you know, Mayapur is nice, but it's a bit hot now. Those Bengalis are kind of driving me crazy and so loud at night, those speakers. So taking birth in Russia is good for living in Mayapur, it seems. Hare Krishna. My wife always says, yeah, I love Mayapur, but I love my house in America. So she's in America now. So must be bad karma or something, take birth in America. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are fortunate in your next birth, you would, in your next life, you will take birth in Siberia. And that will definitely be your last life. For sure. Now all the Siberian devotees, when they hear this thing, I'm like, what's wrong with him? How can he speak like that about Siberia? It's such a beautiful place, such a nice... We're just having fun. Um, um, Shastra says, you know that verse? Boma, it, it, it's a, the Sanskrit is Boma Ijati. Uh, if you worship your place of birth, Boma Ijati, your, your place of birth is like your worshipable deity. Said so then you're like, you're like a go kart you're like a cow or an ass. You're, you have this, that's what a cow and ass thinks. This is my home. But you know, I read that verse many times and I never, never realized how deep, how true that is. Because if I go to another country and I can speak like five words in their language, like they love me. It's like, oh my God. And if I know something about their country and I tell them this is, and I compliment them, it just melts their heart. And if I tell them something I don't like about the country, it was like, here's your ticket, get out of here. We don't want to see you. I mean, this is my experience. Both, I've been on both sides of the coin. So it's interesting, right? So I hope the Siberians still love me. We're just joking. Sort of joking. Kind of, but there is some truth there. Okay. Nadia is asking, is my understanding correct that it's okay to desire something and pray for something that in my opinion will help me in my Krishna consciousness? Or is it better to say whatever you want, Krishna? Well, the answer to your question is, if you have to ask the question, then, it's, then the answer is the first part. If you don't have to ask the question, the answer is the second part. Because... If you were on that stage, whatever you want, Krishna, you wouldn't ask the question, right? So that's what I mean about being real. You don't like the, should I get married or shouldn't I? Well, that's easy to answer because if you shouldn't, you wouldn't be asking the question in the first place, right? Correct? So sometimes, sometimes, they're after me. Somebody's after me. Oh. Yeah. So, um, yeah, sometimes, you know, like, like, 
If I just chant Hare Krishna, won't this problem go away? That's a that's a common question, and it's a very good question. You know, will the process of sadhana bhakti will it heal everything, physically, emotionally, mentally, intellectually? And my answer is, well, if you're asking the question, I guess it didn't, because otherwise you wouldn't ask the question, because it would have been healed, right? So sometimes your answer is in the fact that you asked the question. Now, maybe it healed for somebody else, and it didn't heal for you. Okay, that's fine. So, so generically, yeah, it will heal it. But if it didn't heal it for you, now what are you going to do? Be sick the rest of your life? on a philosophical point that it's supposed to? All right, it's supposed to, but it didn't, so now what? You know, I broke my knee and it didn't heal. And I was chanting Hare Krishna to my knee every day for the last month. You think I should like do something about it? Yeah, maybe. Might be possibly a good idea, yeah. You're, of course, you're, you know, didn't heal, do something. Now you can do experiment, you know, chant Hare Krishna to your broken knees, you know, it's a lot cheaper and faster. Well, not maybe not faster. Yeah, maybe. That would be a great experiment. But so being real is important. So sometimes the fact that we ask the question, the answer is in it because we wouldn't have asked it. Should I get married or shouldn't I? Nice sticky brahmacharis don't ask that question because it's not on their mind, right? The people who ask that question are generally the ones who need to be married. My husband becomes hang, um, angry when he's hungry. Well, you have to keep a big jar of gulab jamans. And when he gets angry, just open your mouth, close your eyes. You will get a big surprise. You know, like that. And then when he's full, here's how it works, Kavita. Whatever you want from him, just fill him up. And after he eats and eats the dessert, he's a good mood, choking, laughing. That's when you ask. You know that? That's how it works. So, little diplomacy in household life. Okay. Nisatma buddhi kunape chidaduke. That's the verse. One who has the buddhi like a kokora, an hour, a cow or an ass. Nisatma buddhi tunape chidaduke. I think the body of three elements is myself my first places. Question from Himal. How to become like you, Prabhuji, always thinking about Krishna. Hmm. Need a lot of prasadam. Um, how to become like me. Focus on your rounds, read a lot, talk a lot about Krishna, associate with advanced devotees. Go to the Holy Dham regularly and do service to save the fallen conditioned souls all the time. Nadia knows how I think. That's a good sign. If you've heard, you've heard hundreds of my classes and you don't know how I think, then that's not a good sign. Because partially the reason I give you these classes is so, because I know other people are going to ask you the same questions. So you know how to answer them. I have a gulab jaman in the fridge, but now husband is in India. Oh, okay. Well, tell him to buy a jar of gulab jamans and eat one and not every hour, so he never gets hungry. Where are you, Kavita, right now? Hare Krishna Maharaj. I'm in Delaware, Maharaj. Oh, you're in Delaware. Oh, I'm going to Delaware. When am I going to Delaware? Tomorrow? Yeah. Today? Today or tomorrow? Tomorrow, Maharaj. I'm going, I'm zooming to Delaware tomorrow. Delaware is one of the smallest states in the U.S., right? How many people live in Delaware? What's the population? One million. The state in the United States, there's only one million people. You, you just take a 10-minute walk in New York, you see one million people, New York City. Um, yeah, I've never been there. It's this very small state. Very small place. We're going to do a Zoom to the congregation there. Uh, send your husband gulab jamuns in the mail. You know that we do that a lot when people donate, regular donors, they would get 
If they lived in the same city, they would get Mangalarti sweets mailed to them. You know, you freeze them and then you mail them. And that's a nice seva. Okay, should we read a little more? We have time if there are no more questions. So this is text eight. Oh, my Lord. You know, it's interesting. If you go to the word meanings, there's nothing that says, oh, my Lord, that I see here. But it's a prayer. So Prabhupada put that in. Oh, my Lord, because of lusty desires from the very beginning of one's birth, the functions of one's senses, mind, life, body, religion, patience, intelligence, shyness, Opulence, strength, memory, and truthfulness are vanquished. Wow, that's a high price to pay for lust. Let's go over the list. This is what you lose by lust. The function of your senses, function of your mind, function of your life, the function of your body, your religion, your patience, your intelligence, your shyness, your opulence, your strength, your memory, and truthfulness. Basically, you lose everything. Wow. This is interesting. Kaman rid rogam. Rid means heart, rogam means disease, and kama means lust. Kaman rid rogam. The disease of lust. How many people in the material world think of lust as a disease? They think of it as a dessert, I think. Don't they? You know, like the icing on the cake at the end of the day. And um, the single men, you know, are preoccupied with it all day. And here, here, Prabhupada is saying, it's a disease. Kaman rid rogam. Wow. And that disease you lose so many good qualities. In the story of a Jamil, you remember the story of a Jamil? Jamil was a Brahmana. And uh, he became attracted to a prostitute and had a relationship with him, with her. Um, the word prostitute is a broad term in, in that society. It could just mean girlfriend, like a mistress. Because we distinguish mistress. Prostitute means like a public, like it's a job. You're public. Mistress in this sense means a monogamous mistress. That's my understanding. He had a mistress. And but she was also, he met her, I guess he met her as a prostitute and then became monogamous. Anyway, he married her. He gave up his other wife. Not his other wife. He gave up his wife, married her. And Prabhupada said he was a brahmana, but he lost all his good qualities because of that relationship. So that's just a demonstration of what's being said in this verse. Hmm. So it's very important. That's why brahmacharya life is important in the beginning. And we know what's going on in the world today. That there's no understanding of brahmacharya. So it's, that's really, you know, if you, if you look at the four regular principles and you see the ramifications of breaking them, then you can understand if people in the world were following the four principles, pretty much it would eliminate most of the problems we face. Because the four principles of religion, uh, cleanliness, austerity, truthfulness, and what's the other one? Why am I not remembering? Austerity, cleanliness, truthfulness, mercifulness, and austerity. The four sinful activities which we avoid are the ones that degrade those four activities. So if people follow the four regular principles, then cleanliness, austerity, mercifulness, truthfulness will be fully enacted, imbibed within society. And it'll make, make a huge difference, huge difference. So. It's interesting just to look through this lens that, that 
the source of the problems that we're seeing in the world today are because we're not following those four principles. Isn't that interesting? Did you ever think like that before? Like each one of those, intoxication, illicit sex, gambling, median, each one of those has a whole, whole, there are whole issues that stem from breaking those principles. And when you see this degradation in society and how things are showing up and we, we look at it and we think, well, this is so bad. How can people do this as so-called human beings? Well, when you break those principles, that's what you do. And therefore, in Vedic education, Guru Kula, you start from the beginning teaching self-control, teaching to follow these principles. And when the British came, they wanted to change Indian culture. They, they thought Indian culture was primitive. And you know how they, one of the main ways they did it, but they didn't have social media then. If they had social media, they could have done it. Like they wouldn't have to do it. It would have, social media would have done it as we see. But one of the ways they did it was through the educational system. They destroyed the Gurukul system. When the British came, there were thousands and thousands of Gurukuls training young men in brahmachari life in self-control, discipline, and spiritual values, and they destroyed that. And that destroyed the backbone of India. Did you know that? There were thousands and thousands of Gurukuls that they destroyed. Because your culture starts with your education, right? In America, when you go to university, that's when you really, you really learn how to break the four regs in style, or two of them anyway. It's kind of a paradox, don't you think? You go to, you get a university education. What did you learn? I learned how to drink. I got really drunk in university. And I had a lot of girlfriends. That's that's where where it really took off. And we call that education. It's not education. It's an education in degradation. So ladies and gentlemen, we have established Guru Kulas on every street corner if we want to save the world. Just like we hear all these traditional values and now in our modern culture, often when we hear them, we think this, this is not gonna work or we can understand, well, it could work. You know, if I understand the principle, it's nice, but it can't work in our society. That's the problem. Because of the way we're raised, these things, these principles can't work. We're not raised that way. I was once asking a devotee, he said, why is it in India your divorce rate is so low. He, when I asked them, they were in their forties. And he said, his wife said, he said, because from a very early age in our life, we were taught that you get married once. That was just the samskar. It was like in the blood. There's no, there's no thing, such thing as married more than once. So sounds pretty simple, right? Um, is that samskar in the blood of the West? You might say it's in your blood because your parents never divorced or you're, an, you're against divorce. But even if you say that, there's divorce around you everywhere. So it does get in your blood a little bit. You know, and your kids... Your kids are going to grow up and half their friends are going to be in families where the parents are divorced. That says something. It makes it normal. It's like, yeah, well, that's just normal. Your parents, you know, it's going to come to the point when you're, your parents aren't divorced. Do you say like your same parents that both your mother and father? Like, that's weird. That's strange. I haven't seen that. That's what it's going to come to. So divorce will be like, yeah, this, what's wrong with you? You're not divorced. You must be a slave. So that's the problem when you're raised in a culture that doesn't support Krishna conscious principles. They start to seem difficult to follow, impossible, weird, strange. You ever looked at some Krishna conscious principles and think, that's so strange? And then you go to India and nobody thinks it's strange. 
different culture. They think we're strange. Okay, we may have other questions or comments. Let's see. Uh, we don't, it's just the verse. Okay, we can read one more, maybe two. So this is text nine. Oh my Lord, when a human being is able to give up all the material desires in his mind, he becomes eligible to possess wealth and opulence like yours. Well, that's, there is a price to pay for giving up something, but look what you get. Everything comes with a cost, but you always wanna look at what you're getting. If you just look at what it costs, you could be quite discouraged. But if you look at what you're getting, then it's different, right? I always give this example, like if I say, do any of you have $10,000? And, and, and most of you will say, right? Would you have $10,000 you could just send me right now? And most of you will say, no. Or let's say 25,000. And most of you will say, no, I don't have it. Then I say, you know, there's a house in Mayapur, four stories, cost them $300,000 to build it. And they're willing to sell it for 25,000. You want to buy it somehow or other? Somehow or other, all of a sudden, 25,000 is like, wow, that's cheap. Well, a minute ago, you said 25,000 was a lot. Now you're saying it's cheap. Is it a lot or is it cheap? Well, it depends what it buys. If, I, if you say, Mahatma Prabhu, why do you need $25,000? I say, well, I'm looking at this bicycle. It's amazing. You've never seen a bicycle like this. It's like you're floating on air. But $25,000, how about like $200? No, that's a piece of junk. I need this one. And you're thinking, no, I'm not going to give you $25,000 for a bicycle. That's way too expensive. But for a four-story house in Mayapur, $25,000, that's cheap. So we're thinking, oh, I have to give up, give up this, give up that to be Krishna conscious. It's so difficult. I can't do it. It's too hard. No, but you have to look at what are you getting for it? And all of a sudden you realize, oh, that's quite possible. That's, that's not so hard because look what I'm getting. That's actually cheap. So it's important to see things in that perspective. Don't you think? Otherwise, you think, you know, get up to get up early, so difficult to chant 16 rounds, so difficult, have to do this, have to do that, so difficult. You don't think that way when you understand, no, everything will come from this. All blessings, all happiness, all realization, all nectar, it will all come from this. Then you think, wow, that's not much to get all that. Actually, that's quite cheap. And many, many, many times, Prabhupada said that. Many, many, many times he said, Krishna consciousness is easy. And we're thinking, easy? It's not easy. 16 rounds, I have to do that every day, the rest of my life, no matter what. And giving up sex, oh my God, that's worse than dying. Some people say like that, rather die than give up sex. Right? And so Prabhupada had to deal with that a lot because that's how we thought. And Prabhupada was always telling us, no, no, look what you're getting. This is easy. This is cheap. You're getting a house in Mayapur, four stories for $25,000. And you're saying that's expensive? No, it's cheap. So Prabhupada had to remind us, you're getting prema. It's, and you're getting it for 16 rounds. That's cheap. Good deal. Don't forget it. Okay. So let's end class now. There's no more questions or comments. And we can prepare for yapa. I mean, japa. Well, if you're in South America, it's yapa. <laughs>